Thank you very much to the IFAA for inviting us to speak today about the subject of digitisation and the challenges it's solving in the claims management landscape and the opportunities it's creating. There's a myriad of opportunities and so this is a great opportunity just to share some thoughts at an industry level and I, I just, I'll just stress that at the moment. The thoughts I'm going to share are industry level because I think that's a good way of looking at it. So just think about what changes is it providing positively for the industry. It, is, it, it really is changing the landscape and what we've done from a Lloyd's perspective is invite to join us today two of our really uh, trusted people that we've got in our service network that are helping us crack the digitisation space and they work for McKenzie Intelligence Services and that's Forbes McKenzie and Vicky Mills and together we're going to share some thoughts on the impact that digitisation is really making and one of the best ways really of grabbing digitisation and actually seeing what impact it's making is really to see it in action because people talk about it a lot and sometimes we struggle to actually see what that concept is. But what Forbes and Vicky will do today is they'll really bring it to life so you can see it. And that's exciting because when you can see it and feel it, you can see the real potential. But bef before we do that, I thought what we'd do is just, just put some framing in there because it's quite important. The backdrop, when, we, when we're thinking about an insurance carrier, and we're thinking about striving to deliver a leading claim service. What does, that, what does that really involve? What's the framework? Because I think getting the context clear helps us think about the digital opportunity. I'd suggest at an industry level, so this is a perspective, that the two core pillars here for delivering that leading service are quality and they are pace or speed. You really need both. How quickly can you move as a carrier and at what quality? And those really, I think, underpin delivering that leading service to the policyholder. But if, if they're the two core pillars, then that really, there are some enablers around that to enable the carrier to actually deliver quality and pace. You have to have the right culture as a carrier. You certainly need the right skill set within your team and your extended network got to have the right processes and you've got to have access to the right technology. Just here alone, just thinking about those aspects, digital opportunity is, is, is genuinely rampant in all of those areas as opportunity, positive opportunity. But I, I think what's fascinating at the moment for the industry is mining it, as I call it, or finding it. How do you find where the opportunity genuinely exists to use digital assets because it, it isn't always as obvious as one might think and I, I consider it to be very much about mining you've got to go and look for it and we'll talk specifically about claims in a moment but, but at an industry level without doubt what we're seeing already in digital opportunity is there is an opportunity to have a positive impact at the point of placement at underwriting. So an example would be, think about a world where you're an underwriter and you're invited to participate in a risk, take a decision on quite a complex insured placement. And you want to actually test the asset schedule that's being put forward to you. Number of buildings, containers, even productivity, throughput. Today, we are either at or we're at the brink of changing how we consider that from an underwriting perspective. The ability to call up, almost virtually now on demand, almost, we are closing that gap. Remote imagery, satellite imagery, insufficient detail for you to look remotely at that asset. Test the number of buildings yourself independently. Remote observation is real. <clears throat> and it's, it will change the way underwriting takes place. It is already beginning to push the boundaries. And that's got to be a huge positive. That's got to be a real positive. Um, other things, individual claims, digital assets, 
are making an impact, and we'll talk about that and give some examples. But analytics, analytics, as we see digital opportunity come through in claims management, you've also got the ability to aggregate huge amounts of data retrospectively and start taking a better informed view about what's happened and making judgments for the future. I think the audience generally or, or the industry generally isn't challenging the value of digitization. The industry is challenging actually where can you maximize the deployment because you have to think, I think, quite carefully about where you try and exploit that in a positive way. The whole ecosystem, whether it's the engagement between a loss adjuster and the carrier, the communication, yeah, there, there is still quite a traditional, in many instances, process, sequential experience that takes place. In a digital world, the opportunity really is there for that engagement to be real time, conversational, from the lost site, straight to the desk. And, and part of the industry is already using it, but it's going to get to a point, I think, where that becomes business as usual. And that provides great opportunity. Imagine the ability to make advanced payment decisions from your desk, talking to your expert in the field while they're on site, showing you and you're making a combined decision about the damage you're seeing. It's real, it's happening now, and it is going to become business as usual. It's a really powerful thing for our insureds to be able to offer that. And that's a real leap forward. And we're starting on that journey as an industry. But where do you look for these opportunities to actually change the future? Offer some thoughts would be you have to, I think you have to take a step back and then deconstruct the process that's happening today. I think take it apart and actually look for the opportunity in each part of the process. So here, just as an example, and this isn't comprehensive because it will vary by risk type, but I think it's an illustration of actually how you can start to mine and explore the opportunity. If we accepted that on a standard claim, a claim that we might all be familiar with, there would be a sequence of activity from first notice of loss, triage, trying to get your arms around actually how complex is this claim, the investigation, making a decision, whether you use an expert or not, and the processing. I think to find out what digital opportunity exists, I think you have to break the process down and ask your question every time in each one of these areas, what's the opportunity? What can we change here using digital assets? What can we change? What's the art of the possible? And I think if you went back five years, there would be some parts of the industry which would be questioning Actually, can you actually change this through digital technology? I mean, seriously thinking, I I'm not sure that's really possible. The past five years have seen a, sh a significant shift in people's attitudes towards the ability to actually use this technology to change the future. It's happening now, and we'll talk about some of that. The, the, other, the other thing I think is, when you're trying to mine out and find where those opportunities are, it is so sensitive to risk type, and we'll talk about that as well. Some risks are fairly straightforward, fairly simple. The opportunities here are much wider, deeper. Some risks are more complex, and maybe the opportunity is more precise in terms of where you're going to be able to use this technology and digital approach. Um, but what are we really striving for in this landscape that's changing now? as carriers for the policyholder, really. We're striving to increase the speed at which we can make that claims assessment and provide that service. If we can increase the quality, and if we can make sure and reinforce that it's about relative cost. It isn't always about cost reduction, but it's about actually how do we push the question of cost, cost of claims management, cost of claim, 
and, and make sure that it's relative to the, the individual circumstance we're dealing with. It's about getting relativity. I think the digital toolkit really does help us push towards enhanced quality, push the pace up and actually make relative cost much more realisable. When, when, we're looking, when we're looking at those, I mean, just this is an illustration at the moment, deconstructing the process to look for the opportunity. We did this, I mean, it was two and a half, two and a, about two and a half years ago for Lloyd's. We just talked Lloyd's, not the industry at the moment. Lloyd's. We really wanted to test the art of the possible. What is possible? And we focused on cat response, major disaster response. We were absolutely certain that with the advent of technology, remote technology, there was a way to more quickly understand what was happening on the ground after major disasters. So what's the ground truth? How many buildings are damaged? What's the extent of damage? We were absolutely convinced that with remote technology, such as satellite imagery, and an associated expert eye to interpret the damage, that there was an opportunity to change the way the industry looks at major disaster, both in terms of understanding more quickly what's happened and also actually begin quick, more quickly to put a price on the cost. We were thoroughly convinced there was opportunity. And two and a half years ago, we asked McKenzie Intelligence Services, who are going to talk shortly, we asked them, can you help us deliver on that hypothesis that we can get intelligence from the ground quicker, we can know sooner what the cost is going to be and we can know with more detail what the damage on the ground is post event. And we asked them to help us as a partner try and prove the art of the possible. And so that was two and a half years ago and Forbes McKenzie, who's the principal owner for McKenzie and Vicky Mills who's supporting Forbes are going to talk now about actually the journey from that discussion, what's been built, how it's been used and the impact it's been made and it's a great example of actually converting the digital opportunity into real policyholder impact and so they're going to talk about that now and then we'll talk more broadly afterwards about some of the other wider industry benefits. Thank you. Um, my name is Forbes McKenzie uh, and I'm the owner of McKenzie Intelligence Services. Uh, we are a geospatial intelligence company. Uh, we provide uh, intelligence in support of the insurance industry um, during times of natural catastrophes. And we disseminate that information via a portal which was made specifically for the insurance industry. And as Phil mentioned, two and a half years ago, the journey started. Um, I, in fact, was working in... Iraq um, on a deployment um, and I had a phone call and the question was would you and your company be interested in coming into Lloyd's and discussing how remote sensing which your company does very well and how it might be applied to the insurance marketplace. Um, I must be honest at the time we were kind of waiting for the phone call it's something we'd, we'd worked very hard to get towards and we were very very pleased um, when Phil Godwin and Michael Band asked us to come in and discuss the possibilities. Um, having discussed the possibilities, we um, worked with the uh, Lloyd's Market Strategic Claims Group to really refine and understand um, where the pain points were. Um, this was a nine-month process, and we were free to work pro bono because we understood there was real purpose here in understanding what we could do and what we couldn't do. And I think that's also very important. Remote sensing, geospatial intelligence has multiple applications, but clearly you can't deliver something if the technology is not there yet. Um, and Phil made reference um, a couple of minutes back about we're almost giving instantaneous feedback from space. No, we really are on that cusp. But you know, there is technological um, restraints it's difficult to put things in space. It's difficult to see on the ground what it sees in, in space. And it's those planning assumptions and understanding what you can and what you can't do is what was bottomed out in, during that nine-month process with uh, Phil and his team. 
Um, a little bit about myself and my company. The core analysts and the analytical capability are all like military intelligence. Um, we effectively, during the noughties, um, worked in the Middle East and Central Asia, playing with um, American satellite capability, of which at that point cost tens of thousands of pounds per hour, not per day, per hour. And, but we really understood the limitations and the capability and the stretch capability of what satellite sensing could do. When I left the military in 2010 with my two colleagues, we were asked um, by Aon, in fact, to look at um, a North African port. And the question was, there's a huge loss, there's been a fire, it happened a year ago, um, could you tell us via interviewing people on the ground um, what, took, what took place and when the fire took place? And that was really important for the hours clause. I said, the port is still an active war zone, why don't we take a satellite photograph? Went, no, no, it was a year ago. And at that point, I said, well, no, there is a library of satellite imagery going all the way back um, some 20 years now, almost. And we were able to dial into that library and ask the question, on what day was the building there and what day was the building not there? And therefore, that was the, the end date. And that really was our introduction to the London insurance marketplace. Fast forward a few more years. The company worked with Google Earth. Um, Google acquired a satellite imaging company called, um, called, called, called Skybox. Skybox took the multi-billion pound satellites and squashed them into a little box that size. And all of a sudden, satellite data was at a cost which was reasonable to MUs. And we incorporated those new data feeds with existing older data feeds, and we came up with a system which went into production, minimal viable product, in summer 2017. At the time, it was myself plus three people in the business. Um, we would... We did not assume that Hurricanes Harvey, Irma and Maria was going to occur um, six weeks later. Phil promises me at the time, he felt it, that it was round the corner. <laughs> he actually did. <laughs> and um, you know, we assumed there would be one big event per, per, per year. So the vignette I'm going to talk about is Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Harvey actually queued up what we then made in 20. 18, 19, and the Ford product roadmap for 2020, because it really let us understand what the market needs, where and how, and at what time. Harvey, for those that were involved in it, and many in the audience would have been involved in it, and indeed probably still are, um, was a significant um, hurricane. It made landfall on Rockport, where it was a wind event, slowly moved on to Houston, where it rained, was pushed off Houston by high pressure area to the north, came back onto Houston where it rained some and more. And for seven days, there was significant levels of precipitation. Our planning assumption for our service line for Lloyds and the Lloyds Market Association Claims Committee was that the, the wind event would move and we'd take a nice satellite photograph. Usually with fast flowing wind events, there's an area of high pressure behind it and you get a good opportunity for an image. That didn't happen for us. So we had to look at the wild gamut of remote sensing technologies in order to fill questions for the exposure teams within 24 hours, claims teams within the next 72 hours, and then for the claims reinsurance community up to 168 and indeed beyond um, hours. How do, we do, how do we do that? And that's really the kind of purpose of the presentation is that remote sensing and satellite imagery from space is not just a pretty photograph. We have synthetic aperture radar where we can see through cloud. That's what this looks, looks like here. We can image the ground through cloud and then the imagery needs to be interpreted. Um, so that's what we do. The imagery analysts that we employ are used to using synthetic aperture radar, which is what you saw there. It's a way of seeing metal objects on the ground. But in this case, we were looking at water on, water on the ground, where the water was. And within 24 hours, we're able to understand where there's standing water on them ground. Um, it's essentially what we made was a pixelated picture of Houston within 8 to 24 hours, 10 kilometer square blocks. And we coloured those 
those square blocks in as to how bad it was likely to be on the ground and what the likely impact was going to be on the ground to properties that were in there. And our aim as intelligence professionals is to inform the, the triage community, the loss adjusting com community, those first responders on how best to put their plan together in order to do the very, very best that they can for the insured. Whilst maintaining an information process uh, back to the, um, the underwriters, wherever they may be around the world. There's multiple sources of data that we took in. Phil made reference to ground truth. Yes, we can see from above, but we can also see, smell, hear, feel on the ground. The image in the background is the, is the assessed um, flood extent. Uh, water clearly moves upstream, to down, uh, upstream and, down, and downstream. We incorporated that information and then started to cull, colour in, this time at zip code fidelity, the likely impact to properties and businesses on the ground. I draw your attention to the, um, to the bottom left hand side, my, my left hand side, your right, of, 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 the, of the screen. We still, within the first couple of days of the event, could not see through the cloud apart from radar. So we started to use um, CCTV, visual analysis of what's taking place on the ground. Um, municipal roadways in, in North America are federally owned, the CCTV systems that are available. There's toll information. The question is, is the road being used, yes or no? Has somebody paid to go on that, on that road? So starting to answer questions, particularly for access, business interruption, ingress, is the property or industry site open? And we can quantify, quantify that. So bring that, in, that information in as well. And then lastly, for the Internet of Things, because that's what we, what we now increasingly use, and I'll mention that as, as well, Lots of gauges, the water gauges showing the flood level and the flood extent on them ground. And combining all of that information before we still had an image from space or indeed from, um, from the air, starting to get great levels of fidelity at zip code and indeed sub-zip sub code um, fidelity within, within three days of the event. Um, that's what synthetic aperture radar looks like from space. It's lots of blotches. It essentially shows you where standing water is. Here, I made reference earlier to, um, to toll information. There are a number of, of software tools. Um, many of the ones will know ways, which will tell you whether there is traffic on the roads and if it's moving. Um, and that gives a really good picture of seeing and hearing and feeling what is happening on, on, the, on them ground. And then it was only after seven days when Harvey eventually moved up to Louisiana were we able to see on the ground and aerial imagery. Um, and the aerial imagery is excellent, actually. You can see tiles on roofs. You can see where there's water is physically touching the front door. Um, and there's a lot of work that we can do with satellite imagery and aerial imagery at this, 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 partic this particular point. Now, our planning assumptions are satellite photograph within three days. But with Harvey being a particularly unusual storm, that was not, pos that was not possible. But taking that as a learning tool with much feedback from the marketplace, um, that then informed the product as it is today. So a little bit on what we use. Um, satellite imagery comes in many shapes and forms. Um, some satellites, an example in a second, are the size of a double-decker bus, have their own rocket to go into space. Indeed, Lloyd's Speciality Marketplace ensures some of those large rockets. Sometimes they fail. The best one that's ever been created is currently spin, um, spinning off in the wrong direction after two years of, of um, service. So what we're increasingly finding is that smaller satellites that are being used, which can be easily replaced and put into space. But in, in essence, the planning timelines that we have, and these are planning time timelines. Hurricane Michael actually enabled us to do all of this within eight hours. That was unusual. But our planning timelines are, are, are this. I think my laser here. The first satellites are owned by the European Space Agency and NASA, and they take wide area subcontinental size photographs. So per perhaps um, they'll take 20% the size of a state. Um, and we'll get those fairly early on. They're multi-band, lots of different types of data. I'll talk about those in some detail in a second. 
Then we have the smaller satellites. The Skybox one's now owned by Planet. They are high cadence. They return an awful lot, and they get good imagery. Then below that, we have an airplane, which is useful. It flies underneath the cloud. These are the large satellites here, which take the kind of military-grade imagery. They'll take, effectively, they'll take an image of a laptop from space. So they'll take a 30 centimetre resolution image. And on that point, the first satellites which we will get imagery from, they'll take 30 metre resolution. That's to say a pixel on your screen will represent 30 metres on the ground. Within three days, one of these military grade satellites will have a pass and will have an imagery of that, assuming that there's no clouds, of course. I have drone data across here at seven days. Drone data is excellent. The issue with drone da data is access. Um, essentially, there's a number of companies at the minute around the world looking at drones as a service. We're excited to work with those companies. Indeed, there's the two we are working with now. But the, mod the business model for drones at the minute is still the traditional identify the location, hire the drone, hire the team, get permission for the team to get to the location. Um, if it's a crime scene, that might be difficult. If federal airspace is shut, that also might be, dif dif might be difficult. Um, but as I say, drones are excellent. We use drones regularly, but we can't depend upon drones depending on the situation. Then along the bottom, we have Internet of Things. Internet of Things is excellent. Typically, we get a cadence of five-minute reporting from whatever sensor we're looking at on the ground. So the message here is there's lots of solutions to look at whatever the situation is, whatever the dynamic situation is, and an information collection plan which is created is put together in order to bring together the information that fundamentally answers the question that is being asked. And it's being questions that assist the insured, questions that assist the loss adjusting and the emergency teams, and then questions where the managing agent, the insurance company, wants to understand what is happening. Answering questions around reserving, answering questions around claims payments, uh, answering questions around reinsurance. I regularly get asked about what does satellite imagery look like? <coughs> well, the dashboard to us is, is like this. We'll take all of the imagery into one place. We'll pull out the pieces of imagery that we need that answers the questions. These are some of the big satellites around about the, the outside. Um, it's an exciting world to work in. Um, the kind of point is, is there is a lot of imagery that we can, work, we can work with. And to bring that to light, when we create the information collection plan in order to answer the questions that need to be answered, we draw upon open source intelligence, we scrape open source, we geo-ring fence um, social media feeds, we'll question social media, is there an imagery, is there an image from the ground of that location? We bring together the satellite data you saw a second ago, which is 30 centimeter resolution, which is the best you can guess in the marketplace. Geological Service from the US, European Space Agency, uh, NOAA, uh, GDAX, which is a European Union capability. They're all the raw information data sources that are available to us straight away, short of tasking people to go on the ground. But from there, we can then extrapolate multiple lines of res of data. This satellite photograph here actually has up to eight different types of information in that. And I'll bring that to light in a second. Not just what you can see. What we have here is an image of a wildfire in North America. The photograph from space is lots of clouds. Um, to the casual observer, this image is not useful. The question to us is, properties on the ground, how are they being affected? We're very content that there is lots of smoke. We're very content that the, it's orientated to the north. We're very content that the smoke is moving north because this is the seat of the fire here. But actually, with manipulation, um, and looking at the multi-band, we can see through the clouds and physically see the fire on the ground as it's taking place. And as Phil was talking about, this type of data would be updated once every eight hours, you know, within a working day. 
Um, so we're in a position to give almost near real-time reporting. This location here was significantly out of bounds. It just was not safe for first responders or the Justin community to get to. It also was not inappropriate um, for the homeowners to be there, of course. But this capability gives the insurance community an ability to communicate directly to the insured, let the insured understand we know your property is being affected, we are responding to it in an appropriate manner. This particular example actually resulted um, the day after the image was taken. This resulted in a multi-million dollar claim being paid before the homeowner had returned to their, 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 their property. Uh, we were content that the property was destroyed. Building up how all the information comes together. So we extrapolate the raw information. We do an awful lot of work on aut aut automated extraction now. Um, everyone talks about AI and ML. Well, there's, there's much work that can be done. Um, the computing horsepower that we have now compared to what we had 15 years ago is immense. So we can do continental scale imagery extraction, assisted by military imagery analysts understanding, interpreting what is on the on them ground. Extrapolating that out into information that is useful to us, information that is useful to be disseminated to the uh, to the uh, loss ad adjuster. We bring all of that together. Um, before it comes to the final piece, at zip code fidelity, which is my example that I showed early on, we will push an exposure report out, the likely damage incurred to property that zip code. Raw imagery, so the underwriter can see what is on the ground and inspect their own properties. And then at the, after the event, we'll piece together this story of, of the event, the track, and I'll show all these examples later on. But really for us, as intelligence professionals, bringing together raw information that answers the questions, processing it, analysing, collating it, making sense of it, adding value to it, we then release down here what we call MS dam the, MIS dam the MIS damage layer. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But in essence, this here, the product, which is what we have on the subscription, serv serv subscription service, is what informs the adjusting community where to look. Yes, we can assist the adjusting community by giving a weight of evidence towards a property, but in terms of responding and triaging and how best and where to look, first of all, rather than starting in the southern zip code, we can actually zoom in and go, that is where the weight of damage is going to be. That is where you should focus your attention. Um, we have here in the background Hurricane Michael. Hurricane Michael for us was the perfect storm. Um, unfortunately for those poor souls on the ground, it was also the, the perfect storm. Much damage took, took, took place. Um, we looked at that and responded to that within eight hours. California wildfires, we, we, we look at and respond and monitor and update once every eight hours. How is the information, I've talked about where it's collected and how it's collected and what happens at our side, but actually fundamentally, how is it dissem disseminated? Um, it's a portal. We have an API in production as well. The subscriber buys into the, 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 the portal, the login page. The home page tells the viewer what is happening around the world. We work hard to, we have Phil Godwin working at the C-suite level. We have busy underwriters. We have, biz, we have data scientists, and they're the three audiences, and exposure teams, claims teams, and the, um, the reinsurance teams. And we, t we work hard on having an area where you can focus what is going on. The, the reports page, we have written reports across here, and then the, the page whereby you can do an on-site inspection is across here, and I'll cover those in more detail now. But it's purposely, it's a GIS light capability. It is not a geospatial intelligence heavy capability. There's some GIS manipulation that can, that can be done. But purposely, it's a presentation tool and with some lim limited um, functionality to it in terms of analytics. It's there to, uh, to aid decision making. So in 24 hours from MIS Intel, we will have zip code fidelity or, if we don't have zip codes on the ground, such as the US Virgin Islands, one kilometre square fidelity, an assessment of how 
each property is likely to be affected. Or if it's a fire or it's a flood, we'll build up the extent of that and that, that was what will be presented. Taking information from open source, taking information from social media, um, taking information from a multiple of reputable and tested uh, data, um, data feeds and bringing all that together, Hurricane Michael and history is kind to us with the, the zip, code as, zip code assessments of how bad property is likely to, to, to be. Everything we work on is destroyed, severely damaged, substantial damage, moderately light damage and no, no damage. And they're the assessments that the imagery analyst or ex-military will give. The claims report. Within 72 hours, but ideally in the same period of daylight if it's possible, we'll produce a report with a before and after shot. The before shot um, shows what it was obviously like. The after shot shows the post after the event. And it's the first imagery that we can get. Now, in intelligence, the best imagery is not always the best quality. And what I mean by that is, the, if, we, if we wait a month, we will get a better image. That will happen. But the best imagery for us when Simpsons Tours is the one that's available to us. And we will add the value to that to bring it to life. For example, we'll take the clouds away as an example, um, er, as an example earlier on. But again, allowing busy underwriters at scale to look at the property themselves and make their own assessments or the loss adjusting community to do exactly the same thing. Then lastly, we'll do a reinsurance report. At the end of the event, we'll package the whole event up in six hours, six hour intervals, so you can rewind the event and say what took place at that zip code at that particular time and do a deep dive. Um, we're heavily involved with the reinsurance community looking at fires, and floods and ingress and egress and business interruption um, and this is where th this data set comes into handy. We know when this data set is produced it will be used in anger um, 18 months down the line plus. Um, new for 2019. 2018 it was up to the underwriter, the loss adjuster, to input the locations they were interested in we realised we were suddenly working at significant scale. There may be 2,000 properties to look at, and that is a lot of 2,000 properties to type into the search bar, which we have up the, up the top here. So for 2019, the, the, the busy desk worker can effectively and simply drag and drop their, their, their risk in order to focus in on where the property is on the ground and how that is affected. Excel spreadsheet. Drag onto the ground, and each location is then populated upon the map. The data is held in a local area. We don't get access to, to that. As I say to everybody, we do not want to know your corporate secrets. That's your business. We want to be able to assist you to focus your attentions and make it as easy as possible. Now, combining the location data, I mean, this is a real data set that's been redacted, but this is a real data set for a managing agent for Hurricane Michael. Um, we're able to see quite quickly this zip code actually has a spattering of 10 properties that should be looked at. Um, increasingly, we're asked for, 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 for API access. We're working on that, and uh, we expect the API to be released later in 2019. Now, the visualisation of damage. I talked earlier about bringing together all of the information and creating a heat map. These are the locations that are of interest to us. Assume in the background that my company has done all of the work with the information and all the assessments of how bad it's li likely to be based upon what we can see. And what we now develop is a heat map where it's a darker red colour, that is where the most, dam most damage has taken place. So therefore, the adjusting community, you can focus your efforts on the darker areas here, 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 and, and here. And if we're responding with a drone capability, a drone can only see where you point it, we would immediately send drones one, two, three, four. 
um, issue with drones is, is the, the battery power as well, so therefore conserving the battery. And so it's a command and control capability. Now combining this with the drag and drop, we can actually see quite quickly what properties are severely impacted or not. I very quickly want to go through the claims assessments. My team will give an assessment of value per, per property. So we, we have no damage. Um, for the most part, the property is fine and has been unaffected. Light, dam light damage, we can see roof tiles are missing. This is aerial imagery. Um, this example is from um, Hurricane Maria. Moderate damage. Structural damage, so there's more to be done rather than just fixing the roof. Substantial damage. Most of the roof has been blown, blown off and there's damage to the walls. Severe damage. And then lastly, destroyed. Clearly where it's destroyed is a binary yes, no answer. A computer can tell the difference between completely destroyed and it's fine. The bit in the middle still needs a human eye to it. We're some way away yet from doing the bit in the middle. Why is that? It's because there's a big data set that needs to be trained. I'm afraid the whole world hasn't been imaged 100,000 times and a computer pointed at that 100,000 times. So for the time being, hum um, humans are still very much in the loop, but I feel that gives a sense of assurance. And a few more examples of destroyed. The last couple of slides. Um, I put up the functionality just to really remind and bring home what is available to um, all users. The example across here is the fire. A fire in California. The fire in California um, plays through the timeline of the event. It's updated once every eight hours, as it is with them fires. And we can see the, the fire growth, where the fire is going, how the fire moves, how it reacts on a daily basis to wind. The example we have here, again, is fires for California, but this time we've ingested uh, drone, drone, drone footage, this particular location here, and the drone footage is there, so the non-site inspection can, can be done by the, by the loss adjuster. More access, more details for the drone footage here. Again, we love working with drone data. The issue with drone data is getting the team on the ground. And lastly, for this particular piece here, we'll bring together a report. Sometimes busy underwriters being called into the office, want to read what's taken place whilst they're on the M train in to work. And this is all downloadable. Um, the example we have, we have here is just the reminder of the ability to do the before and after shot um, and the ingesting of aerial data to facilitate that. Fire data across here, individual properties with, bin with binary assessments. A computer did the work here. We then subsequently check it. Um, orange is assumed smoke damage. Red is um, completely destroyed. More work with the before and after shots. And then lastly, the reinsurance time timeline of the event, the through life event. Um, to, con to conclude, um, the privilege of working with the insurance industry is something that we don't take for granted. It's a wonderful place to be. We love the way we're able to take the fast reactive capability that we learned in the military and apply it to uh, a global organisation that wants those types of information and intelligence in the timelines that we're used to delivering it on, using, with, using and incorporating technologies. On a yearly basis, those technologies get better, cheaper, um, and that's something we work very hard on with, with suppliers to keep those, those costs down. Um, we are in a position to uh, offer logons, um, and we would love to hear um, from interested parties um, who would join the um, 79 Enterprise customers who are already supporting the Lloyds of London marketplace. Thank you very much. So th thank you to Forbes Mackenzie for sharing that perspective on what MIS has been able to de deliver, both for Lloyd's and a wide range of other clients as well. I think what it does, it really brings to life that this technology 
is available today and it's being used. And I just reinforce one of the points that Forbes made. As a Lloyds market, we, we have, just talking with the Lloyds hat on, we have used the technology provided by Forbes and his team and the intelligence to settle claims remotely without actually putting our feet on the ground, which is impressive and it's a real positive for the industry. But we need to look at it in the context of ourselves as an industry because the performance capability there that we've seen, and it is impressive, it is part of an overall industry journey using digitization and digital tools. And what I thought I'd just close with is some of the other things that are happening out there and that are being used to further reinforce that drive around the digital assets. So just coming back briefly to deconstructing the process with a view to trying to find out where we can exploit the technology and the intelligence it provides. And these are just samples, but they're samples of real activity that is happening at an industry level and gathering pace. So these are not simply proof of concepts. These are real pieces of technology that are being used actually on the front line by a variety of carriers and firms. And actually when I put this together, it suddenly become much clearer to me again, although I firmly believe it, that this is getting a very busy environment. <clears throat> There's a lot of activity. And um, if you look at the industry press, it is impossible, isn't it, today to pick up an industry press, whether on the web or, or, or a magazine, and actually not see the narrative around insure tech and the tech world. It's there, it's really front of centre, isn't it, that the tech marches on. But what we like to see, I think, as an industry is actually to just stop for a moment and actually pull up and actually look at some of these things in real action and show that they're delivering. And, and Forbes, I think, has shown that it really can deliver. These, this is an example of some of the other things that are happening. Um, and I've just deconstructed it quite simply. Um, you know, if we think about first notice of loss, it's a crucial moment. But we're seeing, and they exist, and they've been built, you know, customer portals where the customer can make the notification and the portal will guide the customer or the policyholders through a series of questions that have been constructed very logically to actually begin to build the claims file even on point on first notice of loss. And why is that so important? Because actually on first notice of loss for a carrier that's the point at which you can start to begin to decide how you mobilise your resource. Do I need a field expert? Do I need a forensic accountant? Do I need an engineer? And the sooner that we as an industry are able to identify that we're going to need support or a certain approach, that is really about how we can begin to change and enhance the policyholder experience. So it, it really, I think, it starts at how quickly can we as a carrier community gather up intelligence that we need early on. And that's, that is a simple example. But that starts to affect everything that goes down the experience. The triage of the, of the claim. How complex is it? What type of client have we? Do they have their own risk manager? Do they have the capability to project manage their way through this situation? And you can build, and, and it is being built, that triage capability to answer those questions and capture that intelligence, and increasingly being used with AI in that space <clears throat> to predict what the needs are going to be. It definitely matters, doesn't it, depending on the type of risk we're involved in. Is it residential? Is it a travel policy? Is it mid-commercial? Is it heavy commercial? Is it complex? Is it oil and gas? Clearly that directly affects how you deploy this technology. But we're already seeing that it's starting to have a positive impact. And the reason, very deliberately, you'll see that there is, there is a gap here that runs right through the claims determination piece is because 
one of the real prizes for the industry, the carrier community, <clears throat> is where we can, where we can do it, is at point of first notice and triage, is to use this technology to pull out the right questions and build up the knowledge about the situation. And it may very well be that very, very quickly, either based on the information presented at first notice, or if we actually are able to persuade the policyholder to use a self-serve app to submit and upload evidentiary documentation, it may actually be that very, very quickly, using the Internet of Things as evidence of what's happened, using the policyholder self-serving, submitting evidence, imagery, it may very well be that we can actually make a decision on that claim within a matter of hours as a regular course. And, 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 the, and, the, and the reason that there are two distinct segments here is about the segmentation as an industry. There can be no doubt that the digital capability that is being built will help us make determinations quicker and faster than we've ever done, drawing on the available intelligence from a digital world. But we should pause there because clearly there's going to be opportunity to increase that pace using that resource. But in the complex end, there are still great opportunities to use digital assets to enhance the experience. And already what we're seeing, and, and so these are real, they do exist, is the introduction and the experiment of portals to match carrier needs for third-party expertise support. So essentially like a matching portal where a carrier will put their needs on and that will be accessible through experts. So the expert can see what carriers need, what type of expertise, third-party expertise. So is it an engineer? Is it a forensic accountant? And when we look at the way our social environment has developed, we'll see a similar thing, I think, at an industry level, this matching portal where you have this exchange opportunity to put up your needs and people are able to see those needs and actually bid, essentially, for the opportunity. It's a natural part of economics. Um, but when we think about the adjusting community, it's hugely powerful opportunities to help carriers and those third-party experts work together to actually take advantage of digital and actually push some of the boundaries. And we just think here, you know, the ability to have real-time capability to be on site with the risk manager and actually make decisions in real time with the carrier face-to-face, -face, that's quite simple. But the ability to beam imagery, analysis in real time and have a dialogue rather than a sequential process that's remote, it's already here and it's being increasingly used. Um, field reporting, and so this already exists and being, being used, is the ability to use an FNOL first notice process to gather intelligence on the first notice, to populate a draft field inspection report. So these are the areas that should be considered. These are the areas of interest and actually feed that intelligence straight through to the expert so they've got it actually before they even go on site at a much more granular level of detail than we've ever seen before. So when we think about third party expertise, there are some great things happening that could actually help the pace in the field and help the detail that the field adjusters or field experts have got. Forbes has talked about drone technology. We're already seeing greater ability to use tools to do 3D mapping, post impact of loss on particular buildings, 3D imagery, estimation of roof damage, auto estimation. It's, it's happening and it's there, it's being used. So that is really starting to provide a toolkit for our third party experts in the field to actually help them focus on possibly some of the other factors that also make a difference. Because what, what ideally I think what we're all seeking is using the digital asset 
to give us some more time potentially to focus on some of the other aspects, the policyholder experience. And Forbes referred to the California fires, which is, which is a great example, is if we think about paradise in California, um, and I was there about four weeks ago um, and had the opportunity to actually walk around what is left of the town there. And it is, it is you know, it's, it's, um, it's for those people who've been to cat, post-cat situations, you know, they're tough environments. And for the people that um, are trying to rebuild their lives there, the insurance proceeds we pay, so we may pay a sum of money. Um, and indeed, as Forbes said, in some instances, we can pay that without actually setting foot. So we can use the imagery to make a payment remotely from 6,000 miles away. But when you've actually made that payment, it actually gives you time to spend thinking about what is it else, what is it that the policyholder might need as well? Because we know from experience as professionals, insurance is about a service. There's a, there's a financial dynamic, but also there's sometimes support, advice that policyholders are looking for. And I think one of the opportunities that digital gives us, it may give us slightly more time to spend on some of the other factors that matter for policyholders. Uh, insurance is about a service ultimately. Delivering the money is one part of it. But some of our policyholders are also looking for advice, support. Some don't have a project manager to help them rebuild. And they need an insurance carrier's support or an expert support. And I think that's one of the great opportunities here. Come, come back very, very quickly to this, this question about deconstructing the process to identify what the real opportunity is. The only reason I'm labouring that just gently is because right now in the industry there's probably a general prevailing view that in tier one risks, and if we think about those as the simplest risks, maybe mobile phone insurance for example, maybe tier two is household. There is a, there's a prevailing view in the industry that you can really take advantage of AI auto-processing to satellite imagery, remote imagery, that there is a general industry view that you can really optimise digital in that space. There's probably less of a positive perspective on whether you can actually translate that capability into small commercial, mid-range commercial, heavy and complex. I'd suggest that without doubt you can definitely find opportunity to use digital technology and support and tools in those other areas. And the way to do it is, is to deconstruct the risks that we are underwriting. So in commercial, I'm absolutely convinced that in some commercial claims the use of remote imagery to make claims decisions is entirely feasible. It all depends on the complexity of the claim and the nature of the business that you're dealing with. But, I, but, but what I see at the moment we're at is good things happening in the non-complex, but there is definitely great opportunity to exploit this in a positive way in the other areas. We just have to be brave enough to push through that. And we're already seeing signs of, of that happening. Um, the other interesting fact could be is when we talk about deconstructing the opportunity, of course what we're doing at the moment is we're looking at the risks and the nature of risks we currently write and how we currently construct the product. And we're saying based upon the products we issue today, can we fit digital opportunity into those products? Imagine if we change the product trigger. Imagine if we began to thought, think about actually what tools do we have from a digital perspective and if we change the shape of the trigger under the policy, could we actually exploit the technology more? 
So a simple example would be if we think about a homeowner's coverage and there is some level of complexity in how you begin to assess the claim and decide how much is paid. But if you change some of these policies to a parametric type trigger, for example, or a trigger that was based upon a ratio of damage to a building that was linked to a certain payment, actually you would multiply the opportunity that was available from digital technology to respond quickly. And so I, I, think, I think when we're, we're thinking about deconstructing what happens today and reshaping the future, part of it is about how do we apply this to the coverage we issue today and part of it is how could we possibly change the coverage we provide to actually exploit the technology more. It's a slightly different way of looking at it. And there is at least one carrier in the industry who is looking at that right now. And I think, I think, I think just to close, because I think this, this really, I think talks to the point, is why? Why as an industry should we pursue the digital opportunity? And I, I think this picture here speaks to that in a very single, clear way, which is, so I took that, I took that picture myself in Paradise in California, and it's the aftermath in one property on the fires. Um, why pursue the digital opportunity? And here, which I think is it's a terrible situation to have faced, but it is, I think, the prevailing very, very clear message and the reason why. The industry, the insurance industry, couldn't get access to Paradise for 30 days because it was dangerous and it was being controlled rightly by the police force, the fire service, very, very limited access, 30 days. Now, during that time, as you can imagine, there's property that's been destroyed and there are policyholders that have been displaced. We've got the ability now, with the technology we've got, to leapfrog over the top of that 30-day embargo and actually look down into the area and make decisions. That transforms our opportunity. So instead of, are we waiting for a 30-day clock to run, we've actually got the ability to actually pierce through that with this technology. And imagine if you lived there and your property was destroyed and you were looking for help from your insurance company. I think that capability is something that we are obligated to absolutely exploit for the right reasons. And I think that, to me, really sums up why we're pursuing the digital journey, because we can absolutely make a difference. And our expert network, such as the IFAA and our loss adjusters and our other experts have the ability to play a part, a significant part in helping us exploit the use of those tools. So I think as a team, it's a fantastic opportunity to take advantage of those tools. It's exciting and I think there's great opportunity. And that I think is, is definitely the future. Great opportunity for the industry and to change the policyholders' experience positively. Thank you. <laughs>